good day, Justin Miller, Oxford College Physics here. We're gonna be looking at some more Faraday's law of induction and ultimately what we wanna investigate is that sign in Faraday's law of induction. So again, Faraday's law of induction gives us that the induced EMF is equal to negative N, which is the number of loops or turns in a conductive loop, multiplied by the time rate of change of magnetic flux through those loops. D phi sub e dt, where phi sub e is the magnetic field flux. So we've got this negative sign there. And what we've done, ultimately, is kind of ignore it and just say we're just concerned with what the overall EMF is as a value. And then we can use Ohm's law to figure out what the current is. But really, there is some directionality associated with the EMF. That happens to do with the polarization, right? You think about a battery, it has a positive and negative. You go from positive to negative, it is a negative potential difference. You go from negative to positive, it's a positive potential difference. So there is an orientation associated with the polarization with an induced EMF just as well. So the easiest way of ultimately determining directionalities is through utilizing what is known as Lenz's Law. Lenz's law is used to determine the direction of an induced current, which is directly associated with the induced EMF. So, what is Lenz's law? Lenz's law is just a statement. And it can be kind of a confusing statement at that. But once you kind of get it down, get down the idea, it's not that bad to use. And ultimately, Lenz's law says that the induced current will produce an induced magnetic field such that that induced magnetic field directly opposes change in flux that is originally occurring. So, the induced current current induces a magnetic field. such that it opposes the original change in flux. So once you've got a current, right, we've got magnetic fields associated with currents. That current in the loop produces or induces a magnetic field that will have its own flux associated with it. The flux associated with this induced magnetic field will be such that it opposes the original change in flux in the first place. That is to say what nature wants to do is keep the overall flux from changing in the interior of the loop. It's the way to think about it. We want really a zero change in flux. So how do we get something to be zero? Well, we ultimately negate out the changes. So here's what we've got going on. Consider this. We're going to take ourselves a conductive loop like this. And we're going to say that there's a magnetic field all over in space that's directed into the board. that this magnetic field is increasing in strength. Over time. 
So as time's going on, this magnetic field's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. What does that ultimately do? Well, in the interior of this loop, conductive loop, we will have a change in magnetic flux, right? We have the area enclosed by the loop, we have a change in magnetic field, we have a change in magnetic field flux, which will induce an EMF, which will then, since it's a conductive loop that's closed, will induce a current. What we really want to figure out is what is the direction of that current? And that's where we utilize Lenz's law. So the induced current induces a magnetic field that is directed such that it opposes the original change in flux. So ultimately, it is producing its own flux that counteracts the original change in flux. So I have to think of it like this, especially when we have magnetic fields that are changing. We have that these little X's, because we said that the magnetic field is increasing in strength over time, these X's are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which correlates with an increase in flux. Change in flux, getting more and more flux as time goes on. Well, nature doesn't want that. It wants the flux to stay the same. How do you get the flux to stay the same? Well, you pop in another magnetic field that produces a flux that opposes the increase. So if these X's are getting bigger and bigger, there's another magnetic field that pops into place. And let's do that with nice purple. We've got another magnetic field, V induced. It makes its own flux that counteracts the original change in flux. So what's up with that? Well, this induced magnetic field is there because of the current that's induced. So the direction of this magnetic field <clears throat> is correlated with the direction of the induced current. That's how we start determining the directions of induced currents themselves, by looking at what the induced magnetic field associated with it has to be directionally in order to oppose the original change in flux. So if we have a field due to a current within the interior of a loop that's pointing outward, what direction is the current associated with it? Well, we need our palm facing in the direction that we want to figure out what the magnetic field is. We have that our thumb is the magnetic field, and we have that our fingers is the current. So fingers crossed in the palm gives us thumb, which means that the current would have to be going around in a counterclockwise manner in this case if it is going to be producing an induced field or inducing a magnetic field that is directed out of the board, which is there to counteract the change in flux with this field, ambient field getting larger. So in this particular case, whoosh, we have induced current is counterclockwise. So what I don't want to give you is the impression that this means that we just need a field that's in the opposite direction of the original field, because that is not the case. So here's a for instance. Let's take another case where we have the same thing kind of going on. ambient field that is all over the place, uniform, penetrating through the loop, producing some flux, and we'll say that it's going to be changing with time. But instead of increasing with respect to time, we're saying that it's decreasing. So what I like to think of is now these little x's are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We don't want them to get smaller. How are we going to keep them the same size? We're going to have to add on to them. That means that another magnetic field has to pop up to add on to this magnetic field to oppose the change in flux that these are producing by getting smaller. So now in this case, B hat induced must be into the board. Again, to oppose the change in flux that's occurring. And you say, well, what is the direction of the induced current that is correlated with this? We want those connected. 
Well, if fingers in the direction of the current, thumb in the direction of the magnetic field, and palm facing to the interior, that has to be, you got it, a clockwise current. So that's really how we utilize, or how we determine that polarization slash direction of the induced current um, that's really embedded within Faraday's law of induction in that name sign there. Opposition to change in magnetic field flux with respect to time. So that's it. let's look at one other thing because sometimes the magnetic field might not be changing, right? What if the area is changing? We looked at something where the area is changing, but the magnetic field isn't. The answer is, <coughs> I'm getting all choked up. The answer is yes, of course we have. We looked at it with motional EMF, right? We had a system where we had some resistor, we had some wires, we had some bar. We moved the bar with some velocity V hat all over in space. We had this nice uniform magnetic field. And what did we have is we move the bar that way, we have a larger and larger area, which then substantiates the change in magnetic field flux, because flux is just B times A in this case. A is increasing, thus the flux is increasing. So let us utilize Faraday's law of induction, excuse me, not Faraday's law of induction, Lenz's law to try to determine what direction the induced current is here. So we don't have that the field's getting stronger or weaker. We just have that the flux is increasing with respect to time. We don't want it to increase. How do we keep it the same? Well, if we pull it this way and we're getting more and more magnetic field in there then, because well, we're increasing the area, we have to have something that subtracts magnetic field off. So in this particular case, we have to get that we have an induced field in the opposite direction to counteract the increase in flux that's taking place due to the increase in area. Well, what direction then would the induced current be? Well, the induced current would have to be cycling around uh, like this, right? So we would get I induced like this, cycling around in a counterclockwise manner. If you think back to what we did with this, recall that when we said we moved this bar this way, we have that the force on the electrons is down because they're negative charged particles. If the force on the electron is down, well, they're cycling around this way. Oh shoot, is not that in disagreement with what we're saying right here? The answer is no. This is conventional current. That's what we've been using. That's what we continue to use. The electron current, yeah, is in the opposite direction of the conventional current. We're not really concerned about the direction of the electron current. We use conventional current, which is in this direction. So everything checks off directionally. And that's basically that. So you always want to look to not whether the magnetic field is necessarily increasing or decreasing, but what the flux is doing. Is the flux increasing or decreasing? What direction do you want to throw in a magnetic field in order to keep the flux the same? And that will allow you then to utilize Lenz's law. All right, so at that, we'll take a nice look at a problem involving some, some more Faraday's law and move on from there. All right, be right back. All right. Ready for this? Here's the problem. Okay, so we've got ourselves a 10 turn conductive loop whose plane is perpendicular, perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field that is directed into the board. And we've got that the area enclosed by that loop is 0.3 meters squared. And we've got that the resistance of that loop is 25 ohms. And we've got the function that describes the variance of the magnetic field is. 
0.3 t squared to e to the negative 0.7 t, where those constants there have some SI units that give us back the magnetic field. This would have to be Tesla per second squared, and this would just have to be per second there. That's fine. And what do we want? Well, we want to first know what is the induced EMF as a function of time. All right, so let's figure that out, right? So we've got this. We know that the induced EMF by Faraday's law of induction is negative n d phi sub b over dt. Well, what do we get with this? Negative n times d by 80 dot b. dt, we're already told that the magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of the area, so the dot product vanishes, and we are just left with this being equal to, we can write this, negative n a d b by dt. Why can I take that a out front? Because a is constant. We're not changing the area with respect to time, only the magnetic field is changing with respect to time. So this is what we're left with. We are left with negative n a d b by dt, where b is, in fact, this as a function of time. So let us start going through this, right? All right, so we got n is equal to negative 10, excuse me, n is equal to 10, a is equal to 0.3, so that just gives us a nice 3 out front there. And then we've got db dt. So we've got negative 3 meters squared multiplied by d by dt of 0 0.3 t squared e negative 0 0.7 t. So what do we need to do? We're going to need to use the product rule here, right? We've got this function and this function here, so we can go ahead and do that. And we can write this then as negative 3 meters squared multiplied by, I'll do 0 0.3 t squared d by dt of e to negative 0 0.7 t plus e to the negative 0 0.7 t times d by dt of 0 0.3 t squared. All right, so we've got this going for us, that's so good, we can go ahead and distribute that 9 through, we won't do that yet, let's just do this, the induced is then going to be equal to, we also got this negative 3 meters squared out front, just keep that there, ah, that's fine. We've got ourselves 0.3 t squared, and then we've got the derivative of e to the negative 0.7 t, which will just give us a negative 0.7 multiplied by e to the negative 0.7 t. All right, and then we've got this term here, we've got a plus e to the negative 0.7 t multiplied by what we're going to have, 0 0.6 t. 0.6 t. So can we clean this up? Sure we can. We'll go ahead and move this 3 through. We'll go ahead and take that. Let's check it really quick so I'm not messing something up. We've got three. Let's put three times. Just a second. This is 0.63. So E induced is going to be 0.63 T squared E to the negative 0.7 T. And then we got 3 times that. That just gives us the 1.8, right? 6 times 3, 1.8. Negative. Negative 1.8. 
0.8 t e to the negative 0 0.7 t. And there's our answer. There's the induced EMF as a function of time. Pretty fancy, huh? All right, what can we do with this? Well, given that we know the resistance, we can then figure out what the induced current is at any given moment in time. So part B asks, what is the induced current at t equals three seconds? Let's go part B. I induced the value that t equals three seconds is going to be equal to E induced divided by R evaluated at T is equal to three seconds, which is then this evaluated at T equals three seconds divided by 25 ohms. So we've got ourselves the quantity of 0 0.63 times three seconds, quantity squared e to the negative 0 0.7 times three seconds minus 1.8 times 3 seconds times e to the negative 0 0.7 times 3 seconds all divided by 25 homers. All right, let's see what that ends up being here. 0.63 times 3 times 9 times exponential of Gives us 1.42, we'll say 1.32 times 10 to the negative 40. 1.32 times 10 to the negative 40. <coughs> ah, there we go. There's the induced current at that specific moment in the time. So, that's fine. That's grand. What happens if we wanted to know what is the maximum induced current? And when does it occur at? Well, that's going to be a little bit more difficult, right? We've got to think about maxima, minima, what kind of function this is. This function is a funky looking function here. This, this goes up, goes down, comes back to zero. We've got sort of this exponential decay in here, and then we've got a t squared term in there. It's a fun looking function. I'll show you a picture of it at the end. But ultimately, we got something that has some maxima and minima in it. And if we want to think about when do those maxima and minima occur at, we have to think about taking the derivative of it and setting it equal to zero. DE by DT to a zero. So now we've got to take the time derivative of E induced and set it equal to zero and figure out what T substantiate that. So whew, that looks like that's going to be a little bit of a doing. Let's just go ahead and take a look at it, shall we? So we've got the DE induced by DT is going to be equal to, well, if I've got product rule there, I've got product rule there that we have to employ here. So Let's do this a little bit carefully. We've got this 0.63 t squared, 0.63 t squared d by dt of e to the negative 0.7 times t. And then we've got a plus e to the negative 0.7 t times d by dt of 0.63 t squared. There's a product rule for that first term there. And then we've got ourselves a minus 1.8t d by dt, e to the negative 0 0.7 times t. Good. And then we've got another minus term here. Minus e to the negative 0 0.7t d by dt of 1.8t. All right. That looks like some good stuff right there. So we go ahead and start taking some derivatives now, and 
getting this all set out here. So we've got 0.63 t squared multiplied by negative 0.7 e to the negative 0.7 t. There's that. And then we've got ourselves 0.63 times 2, 1.26. So this is going to give us a 1.26 plus a 1.26 e to the negative 0.7 t times t squared. All right. Nope, not t squared, just t, sorry. Two times that, just leaving the t. Whew. That should have been deadly. Then we've got this which will give us negative 1.8 t times negative 0.7 e to the negative 0.7 t. And we've got the derivative of uh, this, which is just going to give us a 1.8. We've got a negative, so we've got negative 1.8 e to the negative 0.7 Right, so let us clean this up a little bit. Let's see what we get out of all of this. T there, we got a T there, 1.8, 1.26. Okay, so we've got 0.63 times 0.7 gives us 0. Point, negative 0. 0.441. T squared e to the negative 0 0.7 T. All right. And then we've got plus 1.26 e to the negative 0 0.7 T times T. Oops. There's a T there, sorry. 1.26 T e to the negative 0 0.7 T. And then we've got 1.8 times negative, it turns into a plus, a negative sign there, so we've got a plus, and that happens to end up being 1.26 times t e to the negative 0 0.7 t, Ooh, two plus terms, that's good, and then we just got this lonely old negative 1.8 e to the negative 0 0.7 t. What does that have to equal? Well, we forgot to put that in the end. Equals zero, equals zero, equals zero. So we're finding, again, the maxima and minima. And then we can figure out what the actual largest value of the induced current is. So this is what we've got. We've got to solve this for t. Well, hmm. That's going to be kind of tricky, huh? Is it? Actually, it's not. Because we've got this common factor. We can factor this e to the negative 0.7t completely out of the system. Factor it out. Zero divided by that is equal to zero. And then we've got this. 0.441t squared. We'll add the 1.26 to the 1.26, get a 1.52, 2.52, excuse me, plus 2.52t minus 1.8 is equal to zero. Again, because of this common factor here and the fact that this is all being equal to zero. So this reduces way down into this, which we can quadratic solve. And we'll do just that. Oh, let me use my speaker that has a quadratic formula for sure. And we've got negative 0.441. We've got 2.52. And we've got negative 1.8. Two times, I get 0 0.8368. And is equal to 4.877. So those are the two points in time where we either have a maxima or a minima in the function that describes 
the induced EMF. So one of those <coughs> times we're gonna have the greatest induced EMF and thus the greatest induced current. But we gotta figure out which time. So the question is, which gives the greatest current? Which, which of those two times? So now we're just going back to what we had here before. Here's the induced EMF as a function of time. Here is ultimately the current I'm evaluated at a specific moment in time. It's the induced EMF divided by the resistance. So I'll erase this. I'll leave that induced EMF up there. And let's just do it. Check. T1. We have the induced EMF divided by R evaluated at T1. T sub I. T1 is going to be equal to that divided by 25 evaluated at T1. Excuse me, that evaluated at 0.8368. So we got 0 0.63 times 0 0.36, eight seconds quantity squared times e to the negative 0 0.7 times 0 0.8368 seconds minus 1.8, 0 0.8368 seconds multiplied by e to the negative 0 0.7 times 0 0.8368 seconds all divided by R, which was 25 ohms. So let's see what this turns out to be, shall we? All right, let's do it. We've got four, we got four. I'm trying to make this easy on me. And we've got ourselves 0 0.63 times 0.8368 squared. for that top portion. So we'll go ahead and take that and divide by 25. We get this. This turns out to be negative 0 0.2, 0 0.0237, 0 0.0237 F. Negative sign has to do with the directionality, which we can figure out utilizing the lenses a lot, that we'd have to look at whether the field's increasing or decreasing at that point in time, but that's something that we could do. But there's the value that we get for T1. Now let's look at for T2. So E induced divided by R evaluated at T2, where T2 is this 4.877. I'm not gonna spell that all out again. We're just gonna put 4.877 in for those quantities there. And uh, I did the divide by 25. That was a big mistake. Big mistake. Ah, poor it. All right. Shoot. 0.63 times 4.877. 4 squared times to the negative 0.7 times 4.877. Let's Times e to the times Okay. And It looks like I put stuff in right. 
but let us just do it. This I am getting 0 0.00817. 0 0.00817. It's positive, it has the opposite direction as this time, but ultimately that's the larger value there, right? And that's a grand. So we know that the maximum value occurs at 0 0.8. 8368 seconds and it has a value of <coughs> 23.7 milliamps. So this is what I wanted to look at was a graph of the magnetic field that was changing with respect to time. So this is a plot of the magnetic field. Notice it increases in strength up to some point and then exponentially decays down to zero over time. So what we really want to look at is the induced EMF as a function of time, which is conveniently plotted right here. And what do we have? We've got ourselves some maxima and minima. So right here, we've got ourselves well, a minima, if you will. It turns out to be a maximum value for the induced EMF. It just happens to be negative, but there it is. When's it happening? It's happening at 0.837 seconds approximately and has a value of negative 0.5929. Divide that by the 25 ohms and you get the induced current that we had. The other time when it is a maximum value is right here at a time of 4.877 seconds, which gives us the 0 0.2043 volts divided by the 25 ohms, which gave us the answer for that. So clearly we have that the maximum current is going to be substantiated at this point in time when we have the maximum absolute value of the EMF. In terms of the direction of the induced current, what we really have to be looking at is, is the magnetic field increasing or decreasing? So we had that the magnetic field was pointing into the board initially. And over this time interval, basically from zero to right here, it's increasing in strength. So there's a nice little plot of the magnetic field's variance with respect to time. So from zero to about 2.857 seconds, the magnetic field is increasing in strength. This green plot is a plot of the rate of change of the magnetic field. So if it's positive, it's increasing. If it's negative, it's decreasing. So if it's increasing, we have that to counteract that change in flux, we need a magnetic field an induced magnetic field that's in the opposite direction, which would be out of the page, which would then give us a counterclockwise induced current. So for this particular current occurring at 0.837 seconds, that would be a counterclockwise current. Whereas at this point in time, 4.877 seconds, we have that at that moment in time, the magnetic field is decreasing in strength don't want it to decrease, we want it to stay constant. So what happens? Well, the induced field has to be in the opposite direction as before, which happens to be in the same direction as the magnetic field to begin with, which was into the board. A magnetic field in the board gives us a clockwise current. So that is utilizing the Lenz's law on top of this problem itself. But main thing here, I just wanted to think about maxima minima and how the magnetic field flux is changing with respect to time. So this is a nice little graph that shows us the relations there. So that's it. All right. All right. Good day.